for all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's true, you know. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's true too, you know. That the man of God may be perfectly and thoroughly equipped unto every good work. That's also true. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. There are three letters in the word old. There are nine letters in the word testament. And when you put those two numerals together, you get the number 39. And in the Old Testament, there are 39 books of inspiration. There are three letters in the word new. There are nine letters in the word testament. But this time, multiply those numerals, and 9 times 3 equals 27. In the New Testament, there are 27 books of inspiration. You know, the book that you hold in your hands begins with God. In Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God. The book that you hold in your hands ends with Jesus, In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 21, the Bible says, In the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible begins with what God did for man. The Bible ends with what God has extended unto man in His Son, Jesus Christ. I want you to make with me three declarations, not out loud but in your heart. The first declaration is, I love God the Father. And if I were to ask you the question, well, why do you love God the Father? You would say, well, that's easy, Romans 5 and verse 8. That God demonstrated his own love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What about 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19? I love Because he first loved me. It's easy to love God the Father. Declaration number two. I love God the Son. If I were to ask you the question, why do you love God the Son? You would say that's easy too. Jesus said himself in John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this. Than for one to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus... The Son demonstrated His love toward me, and I love Him because He died for me. Declaration number three. I love God the Holy Spirit. Why is it that that statement right there is more difficult to explain than the first two? I'll tell you what always increases my love of God the Holy Spirit. Every time that I study the inspiration of the Bible, my love for God the Holy Spirit grows. It increases. Now in the book that you hold in your hands right now at this moment in time, God the Holy Spirit makes a lot of claims. God the Holy Spirit in this book claims that it is the unfallible, omniscient, omnipotent mind of God. Acts chapter 15 verse 35. But is that true? The Holy Spirit in this book claims that this book is the word of grace. Acts 20 verse 22. But is that true? God the Holy Spirit in this book claims that this book is the book of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19. But is that true? God the Holy Spirit in this book claims that this book is the word of salvation. Acts 13 verse 26. But is that true? God the Holy Spirit in this book claims that this book is able to save us from our sins. James chapter 1. But is that true? God the Holy Spirit in this book claims 
that it is the breath of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 16, when the Bible says it is inspired of God, that literally means it is the breath of God. Right now, I am pushing, lung, I'm pushing air out of my lungs. It's passing my larynx, vibrating my vocal cords, and sounds are coming out. You could say that it is God inspired when you open up this book because it came from the very mind and the heart of God. But you see, it's not just enough to claim something. Many men have claimed many things, but those claims have gone unproven. If you try to convince an unbeliever as a believer that the Bible is the inspired Word of God simply because it claims to be the inspired Word of God, I'm here to tell you this morning, you are probably going to fail. The Bible makes many claims, but how do we know that those claims are true? Over 40 different authors, written approximately over 1,500 to 2,000 years, on different continents, in different cultures, in different languages, and they didn't have time to compare notes. When the first ones wrote, the latter ones had not even been born yet. And when the latter ones wrote, the first ones had been dead for hundreds if not thousands of years. Yet there is not a single error, not a single fallacy, not a single lie, not a single inaccuracy in all of its pages. How do you account for that? And the only way to account for that is by listening to the words of Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verses 20 and 21 when he said, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of men. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by born of, carried along by the Holy Spirit. The foundation of biblical inspiration is this assertion that the Bible is not from the mind of men. The Bible is from the mind of God. This morning, I'm going to give you what I believe to be three observations from this book of inspiration that in and of itself prove that this Bible did not come from the mind of men, but came from the mind of God. Observation number one. The Bible is the inspired Word of God because of this Books, brevity. Yes, this book is brief, but it contains untold depth. Let me tell you what I'm thinking about. Have you ever considered the virgin birth of Jesus Christ? If not for the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, all of Christianity falls If the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7, verses 11 through 14, written some 700 years before is not true, and if it's not fulfilled through Mary, if Mary was promiscuous before marriage and she made up a lie to cover up her promiscuity so that she would not be stoned to death, then she built the entire faith on a lie. But there's 31,102 verses in all the Bible. Only 21 of those verses talk about the virgin birth. But in those 21 verses, we have all the information that we could ever possibly need to know that Jesus was, in fact, born of a virgin, 
that Jesus came in the flesh at the appointed time of God to bring about redemption to all of God's creation. Have you ever considered the resurrection of Jesus Christ? If Jesus is not risen from the dead, as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14, our preaching is empty, our faith is futile. In other words, everything that we are doing here this morning is completely, totally in vain. If Jesus is not risen from the dead, he was just another martyr who died for the cause. There are 1,189 chapters in all the Bible. Only seven chapters cover the engine of the cross, the resurrection of King Jesus from the dead. Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, Luke chapter 24, John chapter 19 through 21, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. One person put it this way, that the Bible is a stream shallow enough for a little one to wade in, but it is an ocean deep enough for an elephant to swim in. Now I know that some of you have been Christians for 10 years, 20 years. 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Some even you have been Christians for 60 or 70 years and you can't tell me that every time that you open up this Bible, no matter the level of your biblical knowledge, that you do not learn something new every single time you read it. But it only contains 1,189 chapters. Have you ever considered the brevity of the baptism of Jesus Christ? A monumental moment in the life of our Savior. Recorded in Matthew chapter 3 verses 13 through 17 in only five sentences. But Jesus himself said in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 3 that this was fitting to fulfill all righteousness. And it's after his baptism and after his temptation that Jesus then begins his ministry and he begins to work toward the cross. This Bible is brief, but it contains untold depth. There's a lot of books in this old world on shelves that claim to recount the life of men, but the Bible in the Bible alone claims to recount the life of God. There's a whole lot of books on those shelves that claim a revelation. But only this book and this book alone claims a resurrection from the dead. The Bible is the inspired word of God because of its brevity. But the Bible is the inspired word of God because of its impartiality. Psalm 119 and verse 161. The psalmist said, but my heart stands in awe of your word. We need to stop treating the Bible as if it is common. We need to stop treating the Bible as if it's just another book that was written by men. We need to stand in awe of the word of God. Because when we treat it as common... People view it as common. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 11, Paul made this statement that there is no partiality with our God. Now that is not a new revelation whatsoever. In fact, that is the foundation of thousands and thousands and thousands of years of inspired writing. Think about it. Abraham. A great man of faith, as Roger said in Bible class this morning. Romans chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4 says he's the father of them that believe. In Luke chapter 16, in the rich man and Lazarus, in that story, paradise is referred to as 
Abraham's bosom. What a great privilege. But if men wrote this book, they would not have covered the lies and the doubts of Abraham. If men wrote this book, they would have concealed his adultery with Hagar. If men wrote this book, they would have covered up his lies. But my Bible teaches a man by the name of Abraham who was a great man of faith, but he was certainly not infallible. What about Moses, that great lawgiver? The greatest leader given among men outside of Jesus Christ. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 18, Moses said that God's going to raise up another prophet just like me. You know who he's talking about? He's talking about Jesus Christ. Moses is included in the same conversation as Jesus. But one day God told Moses to speak to the rock, and Moses smote the rock. And in his disobedience, God told him, you are not going to enter into the promised land. And as Moses stood on that mountain, and he looked at that land that flowed with milk and honey, the land that he had been leading millions and millions of Israelites toward for over 40 years, he begged God, please let me enter. Please let me go. And what did God tell him? He told him to shut up. He said, Moses, speak no more of it to me. Lift up your eyes. You look to the west. You look to the north. You look to the south. And you look to the east. You behold it with your eyes because your feet are never going to touch it. You look at it. Oh, take it in in all of its beauty. But you are never going to cross over this Jordan. What about the three kings? Surely they would not record the sins and the indiscrepancies and the fallibility of kings. What about Saul, David, and Solomon? I can read about Saul's sin in 1 Samuel chapter 15 when he was disobedient directly to the word of the Lord. And God through a prophet said to him, it is better to obey than to sacrifice. I could read about David's sin in 2 Samuel chapter 11 when he stood on that rooftop and he beheld that woman, he sent for her, he lied with her, and then he tried to cover it up with lies and murder. David, the greatest king of all of Israel, has his dirty laundry put in the pages of the Bible. What about Solomon? Son of David and Bathsheba. And I could read about his sin in 1 Kings chapter 11. And his sin was strange women who turned his heart away from the Lord, and the Lord came to him and said, I'm going to take your kingdom away from you, but for the sake of David, I'm going to wait until you give it to your son. If men wrote this book, they would have shielded us from their sins, from their failings, from the darkest moments in their life. But God wrote this book. And he yields us from our sins, from the darkest moments in our lives, through the examples of these infallible men. On the night that my Savior was betrayed, the very men who wrote the pages of the New Testament fled like sheep who had gone astray into the night. And in their darkest moment, 
when doubt and fear creeped into their minds and they feared men more than they feared God. Those things are recorded for us to read. Why would they record their own fallibility? Why would they record their own sins? Because it wasn't from the mind of men. It's from the mind of God. The Bible is the inspired word of God because of its impartiality. God is not a respecter of persons. And it doesn't matter if you're Abraham, if you're Moses, if you're Jacob. It doesn't matter if you're Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It doesn't matter if you're Paul. It doesn't matter if you're Peter. It's recorded right here for you to read it. But the Bible is also the inspired word of God because of its accuracy. Even the critics of the Bible will say that it's at least 90% accurate. But if they believe in the inspiration of God, they would know that it's 100% accurate. You know that all truth runs in parallel lines all throughout time. And that means that there cannot be an error. There cannot be a misstep. There cannot be a failing. No matter if something was written a thousand years before another. And this book was written over the course of 1,500 to 2,000 years by 40 different men. Imagine that I started right there in the corner. And we played the whisper game. And I whispered something into someone's ear, and they were to pass it all the way through this room to the other side. You and I both know that when it ended up over here, it would not be what it was when it started here. 2,000 years, 40 different men. And all the truth in the Bible runs in parallel lines. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I want you to go back in your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 7. Moses and Aaron are sent to Pharaoh to deliver a message of God to the king of all of Egypt. Now you know it being a message of God, it's going to be accompanied by miraculous means. Why? Because miracles in the Bible were meant to confirm the word. And in Exodus chapter 7, Moses and his brother Aaron, they stand before Pharaoh. And the Bible says the miracle occurs. They drop the rod to the ground, and it turns into a serpent. Well, Pharaoh is puzzled. He is bewildered. He starts to question how this could happen. So he calls for the wise men and the sorcerers, the magicians, plural, of Egypt. And they come in and what do they do? They drop down their enchantments. They throw down their rods and they became serpents. I don't know how it happened, but the Bible said it did. But it doesn't matter because... Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. God is always greater than men. Question. Who were the magicians in Exodus chapter 7? Surely if they lived and they were prominent men of Egypt, they would be recorded somewhere on the pages of some book in some stuffy library for us to read. Surely the names of these men would be in the pages of the inspired Old Testament for us to know and to learn. Surely they would be able to find the names of these men and some hieroglyphic in Egypt and what they put as greatly important in their discoveries. But it wasn't until 1,504 years later That for the very first time in all the Bible were these men's names recorded by Paul. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 18, he said, Now as Janus, 
and Jambres resisted my... Wait a second. Who is Yanis and Jambres? That's the magicians who resisted Moses in Exodus chapter 7. You can look all throughout the Old Testament, every single book, every single verse, and you will never once find their names. 1,500 years later. How do you account for that? The only explanation is inspiration. In Joshua chapter 6, verse 26, you have a prophecy about old Jericho. Now, the army of God has come into the promised land. They're beginning to conquer by faith. They come into the city of Jericho, and God gives them a little bit of a peculiar battle strategy. He says, you're going to march around the walls of this city in the way that I have commanded you, and when you do, the walls are going to fall. So the walls fall, as God told them they would. They go into the city, and they take all. They destroy the city. And Joshua gives a prophecy in verse 26, and he says this. Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city, Jericho. Here it is. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn, and with the youngest he shall set up its gates. 500 years pass. And a man by the name of Hiel, in 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 34, he must not have heard about the prophecy of Joshua because he tries to rebuild the city of Jericho. And what happens? He lays the foundations with his youngest son, Segub, and with the gates... His firstborn son dies, Abiram. And what does it say? According to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through Joshua, the son of Nun. How do you account for that? The only explanation is inspiration. Psalm 22. From the pen of the inspired man, David. He begins in verse 1 by saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Doesn't that sound familiar? And in verse 16 he says this, They pierced my hands and they pierced my feet. Now David lived at least a thousand years before Jesus Christ was born. And if that psalm was written, say, in 1000 A.D., that means that Psalm 22 was written 500 years before the death of crucifixion was ever invented by the Persians. Meaning that David prophesied a thousand years before the birth of Jesus Christ and 500 years before crucifixion was ever invented that Jesus Christ would die the death of crucifixion. How do you account for that? The only explanation is inspiration. Oh, and what does spit have to do with inspiration? In Isaiah 50 and in verse 6, Isaiah gives us a messianic prophecy, and this is what he says. I gave my back to those who struck me. Jesus endured the scourging. Literally a mini death because most people didn't make it through the scourging process of crucifixion. And my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. Jesus Christ had a beard. And when he was in the process of being crucified, people took his beard by their hands and they pulled it out of his face. Here it is. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. 700 years later, in Matthew chapter 26 and in verse 67, as Jesus is on trial before the Jewish high priest, the Bible begins by saying they spat in his face. But it's deeper than that. 
Because on two separate occasions in the life of Jesus Christ, he actually prophesied that it would happen when he went up to Jerusalem. In Mark chapter 10, verses 33 through 34, he said, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, that's him, will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and scourge him, and did you catch it? Spit on him. How could a detail as minute as spit be so accurate? Because this book is not from the mind of men. Its accuracy demands that this book is from the mind of God. In logic, there's a law. Now, you know that any time that there is a law... It means that that's pretty serious. It's not a theory like evolution. It's a law. In other words, it's something that is adhered to as a basic principle of logic. In logic, there's a law. It's called the law of the excluded middle. It literally means that either something is or something is not. For example. A square is either square or it's not square. A circle is either circle or it's not circle. A line is either straight or it's not straight. Now, apply that to what you just learned about this book. Either the Bible is inspired of God or it's not. And from the information that you just learned from this book, 40 different authors, written over 1,500 to 2,000 years, who wrote on different continents and different cultures with different connections and spoke different languages. And they didn't have time to compare notes. Is this book from the mind of men? Or is it from the mind of God? And if this book is from the mind of God, doesn't that mean that this book has eternal implications on your life? For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's true, you know. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's true, too. That the man of God may be perfectly and thoroughly equipped unto every good work. If you're here this morning, you're not perfectly and thoroughly equipped. If you're not perfectly and thoroughly prepared for eternity. You need to listen to what this book has to say about it. You've heard the word of God. You must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 8, verse 24. You must be willing to repent of your past sins. It's not because you're sorry you got caught in your sins. It's because your sins brought about a godly sorrow in your heart. And you know what your sins do to God. 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10. You must be willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10. You must be willing to submit to being immersed into the waters of baptism to have your sins washed away, Acts 2, verse 38, Acts 22, and in verse 16. So that you can rise to walk in the newness of life, Romans 6, and in verse 4, and live a faithful life unto death, Revelation 2, and in verse 10. If you've not done those things that the holy, inspired Word of God tells you you must do to be saved. You're not perfectly and thoroughly equipped yet. You can be this morning. 